an unbelieving heart. We must be on guard against claiming to believe in God while acting as if He does not exist. Here now is Gene Getz. I believe the Apostle Paul was very, very familiar with this psalm, Psalm 14. In fact, much of what he wrote in the first chapter of the book of Romans, and uh, actually in chapters 2 and 3, relate back uh, to this psalm. And we'll see how that uh, happens when we look both at the psalm and then we look at what Paul wrote. In fact, I I believe that uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, actually expands on what David said, and he elaborates on what David said, and he interprets for us what David said that David himself didn't even understand because he was speaking prophetically. So first of all, let's look at Psalm 14, 1 and 2. The fool says in his heart, God does not exist. Now, I want you to make special note of the word fool because he's going to contrast this. The fool says in his heart, God does not exist. They're corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. And of course, when he uses the word wise, he's contrasting that word with the word fool. Now, if you go to the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, notice what you read. For though they knew God... They did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense. Their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now, that ought to be a clue to us that the Apostle Paul is thinking about this psalm when he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and thinking about what David said about the fool compared with the wise. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Now, think about this for a moment. Really, as you read Romans chapter 1, it really is the story of humanity. It's a story of humanity from uh, the beginning of sin entering into the world, leading to the flood, into the era of Abraham, leading again into a, a dismal situation, leading all the way through church history, all the way through human history, up until the time that Paul was actually writing this uh, relative uh, to the Roman Empire. I think he was thinking of the Roman Empire at that time as he was writing these words. But prophetically... This, this actually gives us a glimpse of history, the cycles of going downward, downward, downward. Mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Now, I think specifically, though, David probably was thinking about what happened to the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. And Paul probably was thinking of the same thing, though I think he was thinking much more broadly because... He had much more insight into God's total redemptive plan. But when you think in terms of of, uh, Egypt, I would just challenge you, if you want to, you can just Google the gods of Egypt. And you will see that there were hundreds, multiplied hundreds probably, of gods of Egypt. And even the pharaohs were considered gods and were inseparable from the other gods of Egypt. Now, let me just share a few examples of that. And notice how this relates to what Paul said in terms of worship and departing from who God is. A mute was the crocodile goddess. Now, there's a reptile that was worshipped. Going on, you have Aten, god of the sun. You have Bobby. God of baboons. There's an animal to worship. 
Bast, the cat goddess. Geb, the god of the earth. Genjin, Weir, the goose god. The birds of the air. All right? They worshipped the goose as a god. Uh, Hecate, the goddess of frogs. Uh, this is going almost a little lower even than uh, crocodiles. Uh, Capri, the god of beetles, creeping things. Uh, ba, again, the god of the sun. Kansu, god of the moon. Now, that's just a sample of the gods of Egypt that David perhaps was thinking about and Paul was thinking about, even though Paul was thinking much more broadly in terms of history. So David was probably reflecting on the fact that the children of Israel had been marvelously delivered from this idolatry in Egypt. And you remember how God, through Moses and Aaron, you know, pronounced those incredible plagues. And by the way, all of those plagues were related to Egyptian gods, even including the darkness that came over the earth, because they believed the God of the sun, and God was demonstrating He is the God of everything, including darkness. And you can go through the gnats, the frogs, every one of those uh, plagues that came on the Egyptians really was a reflection of the fact that God was greater than what they believed was a God. Isn't that interesting? So David must have been thinking about this. But prophetically, what happened is that even though God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, came to Mount Sinai, God revealed Himself in an incredible way. Yet, how many times they regressed wanting to go back to the gods of Egypt. Even when they built that golden calf there at Mount Sinai when God was revealing Himself through the Ten Commandments, which was another reflection of the gods of Egypt. And then the kings, once the kingdom was divided, all, 100% of the kings of the north regressed to these pagan gods. And a lot of the kings of the south. So Israel was noted to going back to all of these gods. And so... Certainly, these were in the minds. This was all in the mind of David and certainly Paul as they were reflecting on what is uh, happening here. And then, notice in Psalm 14.3, uh, we read these words, All have turned away, all alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, keep in mind that phrase because look at Romans chapter 3 where Paul summarizes what's happening to the human race. As it is written, and that's key, as it is written by whom? By David. There is no one righteous, not even one. Praise comes right out of the psalm. There is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. He's elaborating, you see, on what David said and interpreting how all of this reflects God's redemptive story. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. Now, notice, there is no one who does what is good, not even one. That's a direct quote right from that psalm. And saying that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here's the reflection and response question. Why is it important for all of us who profess to believe in God and, and Jesus Christ to at some point test the reality of our faith. Well, I think uh, the author of Hebrews captures the answer to that. Watch out, brothers, and there the word brothers. Adelphoi in the Greek text refers to brothers and sisters. Watch out, brothers, sisters, so there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Now, even though it seems that David and Paul were referring to unbelievers, here the author of Hebrews is saying we have to be on guard against having an unbelieving heart. An unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you 
is hardened by sin's deception. In other words, sin, once we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, doesn't mean that we cannot be led astray by hardening our hearts. We can move in the direction of idolatry because idolatry is really putting anything before God. Replacing God with anything in our life. And that sometimes is hard to balance, isn't it? But I think it's something we need to really keep in mind. In seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things that we can get in the place of God will be added to us. But we have to keep our priorities straight. I'm sure you're aware of the fact that many so-called Christians engage in all kinds of rituals. And yet, it still reflects just a ritual and not a true heart faith in the living God. I remember a message that I heard by the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer. And he was reflecting on really this concept of belief in God. And he applied it to those of us who are Christians. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. He said, if every reference to faith in God were removed from the Scriptures, just rip out every one, cross out every reference to faith in God, would it, would it make any difference how you live as a Christian? And boy, I stopped to think about that. Because it's so easy to operate as if God does not exist even though we say we believe in Him. And so that's the essence of that principle. Let me just repeat it for you. We must be on guard against claiming to believe in God while acting as if He does not exist. 